Cities After is a bi-monthly podcast about the future of cities. Grounded in our daily urban struggles, it is part dystopian and part utopian. My intention is to entice your civic imagination into action, because we know that a more just and sustainable urban future is possible. This is Miguel Robles Duran, and I dare you to imagine our cities after. COVID, COVID. global warming, global gentrification, homelessness, racism, colonialism, patriarchy, hunger, police brutality, private property, capitalism. capitalism. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. In this episode, I will explore the urban shifts surrounding the dramatic rise of commercial and residential vacancies during the global pandemic. In the second part, I invited the Marxist geographer David Harvey to have a conversation about possible futures to the new empty spaces that now perforate our cities. Before we begin to imagine what to do with all the empty spaces that now compose our cities, I think it's very important that we look back a few years and understand what was the state of the real estate market before the pandemic. If you would go to any large metropolitan region around the world, one of the things that you would notice uh, before the pandemic is that there was a a dramatic um, construction boom uh, where uh, most of everything that was being built um, had to do with uh, corporate offices, uh, luxury housing, and uh, luxury retail and to some extent, uh, kind of a pseudo-public infrastructure that benefited uh, real estate operations. To give an example, uh, in New York City, um, there was a lot of spending um, in public transportation and uh, subway stations and parks, which conveniently uh, appeared Uh, to support the new large uh, developments uh, that were going around. Urban trends such as uh, famous creative cities or green cities or um, transit-oriented development uh, were being popularized by private real estate development in order to justify um, the creation uh, of such uh, skyscrapers or malls or whatever they were thinking to do. This kind of marketing was necessary um, not only to convince cities that it was a good idea uh, to build these things, but also or primarily uh, to convince uh, foreign investors uh, to spend money in these spaces. Um, the famous sort of neoliberal competition of, between cities for foreign direct investment became incredibly present uh, during the decade before the pandemic. Despite struggling to recover from the 2008 financial crisis that had its roots in the real estate market, uh, cities continued to promote um, the accumulation of surplus um, in in real estate. In short, they saw a way out of the crisis uh, through the same means that produce the crisis. Surplus absorption um, in attractive real estate investments uh, was going to lead the way uh, in the decade uh, before the pandemic. The result was a crazy amount of buildings uh, that were empty and that continued to be empty all the way into the beginnings of 2020. The purpose of so much luxury real estate development, I mean, from Toronto, Vancouver, to Dubai, to Tokyo, Paris, New York, San Francisco, was not to house people or activities. And this is very important to understand. The main purpose that these buildings, this real estate, had was to absorb capital. And to function as investments, uh, assets that could uh, later fill the portfolio of large investment firms or simply the portfolio of uh, very wealthy individuals. 
So the argument that I'm trying to make here is that even before the pandemic, there was an enormous amount of empty space available in most metropolitan regions. If one would look at night uh, towards any of these skyscrapers, uh, the first thing you would notice is that half or if not less of the lights in the apartments or office spaces uh, were dark. Same goes for all the parks that surrounded the many sleeping cities that this period of urbanization produced. The emptiness was very evident. Uh, ever since I started working with uh, different grassroots associations of homeless population, um, I remember very well that one of the principal claims was that there was so much empty space in the city and uh, they needed space in order to be housed. And why was it that they were not able to access that space? Uh, there was an organization uh, in New York City that very famously um, created a map of all the empty uh, buildings, empty office space, empty residential space that existed in order to prove that they could be housed very easily in those spaces and that the city didn't need to spend billions of dollars uh, for creating shelters uh, for them to live temporarily in terrible conditions. So they were claiming that the space was there. Why was it that they could not go in there? It was because the space had a purpose and it was fulfilling that purpose. And that purpose again was to be part of a financial sort of um, markets of capital circulation and sur surplus absorption. And obviously uh, those that commanded these mechanisms of surplus absorption were not necessarily living in New York or in any other cities that uh, was undergoing this similar phenomena. There were uh, multinational uh, investment firms uh, that were very difficult, still till today, to understand who was backing them. Most importantly, they wouldn't care less of anything of the social dynamics that were uh, going on uh, as a consequence of these massive real estate investments and emptiness. Evictions, displacements, um, what we refer to as gentrification, and all the sort of horrible traits of uh, neoliberal urbanization uh, became quite apparent uh, in the days and years uh, before the pandemic. All the indicators uh, pointed towards more growth, um, towards uh, real estate prices going up and up and up. At the same time this was happening, most of the urban population uh, was struggling to keep up with the rising prices uh, of real estate. The contradiction was that cities suddenly had an enormous amount of space available for citizens to use, but the citizens could not use it because they simply could not afford it. So the empty cities that we learned to navigate in 2020 were in many ways already empty. But clearly many things have changed. And I would argue more than change, the pandemic has exacerbated uh, the emptiness in which uh, the neoliberal period uh, supported its uh, surplus accumulation in space. The global markets have grown to accept and to expect uh, emptiness. Having vacant spaces didn't mean that there was no economic output out of those spaces. Uh, it just simply meant that they were vacant and uh, nobody was using or occupying them. But a lot of people were making money out of them. There were some large financial real estate firms that just focused on buying and negotiating and selling and hoarding empty spaces. A notable example of this is the Blackstone Group, 
that during the 2008 financial crisis managed to amass an enormous amount of um, foreclosed homes and property um, that had devastating consequences uh, to communities uh, around the world. This company currently is one of the largest real estate investment firms in the world and operates in every single continent buying out empty spaces. So the business of using uh, real estate as currency um, was functioning quite well and uh, I would argue continues to function well uh, because it's supported by uh, major uh, banking institutions and finance industries and even central banks. One year into the pandemic and most of downtown office buildings in Europe are empty, including malls, uh, main streets are empty, deserted. However, uh, most of the biggest landlords uh, continue to do okay uh, because uh, the central bank um, decided to uh, buy bonds uh, that uh, are currently backed by property debt. So as you see, the, the pandemic in relation to real estate, it's affecting a very different kind of urban dweller or a very different kind of population. And with a different kind of population, I mean the regular urban dweller. Um, the millions of people that struggle to go by every single month uh, that their monthly salary uh, is not enough, that any emergency uh, that they have to face uh, would uh, damage uh, greatly their financial stability. The population that owns a mortgage in their homes or a mortgage in their business, um, all of those that are in debt in order to make their daily life uh, better. And of course, the billions of people that don't have a permanent job, that they live day by day, depending financially on small social interactions, but also of spatial interactions, interactions with their neighborhood, interactions with their street, interactions with their communities, with the different organizations that used to support their work. Those are the people that are suffering the most the consequences of urban emptiness during the pandemic. Note that I'm not trying to argue that large financial institutions or real estate corporations are not uh, suffering any consequences uh, due to the lack of occupation uh, that the pandemic has engendered. The quantitative data that a lot of uh, real estate institutions uh, are, have been putting out around the world is quite dramatic. Um, according, for example, to Cushman and Wakefield, one of the largest uh, real estate companies in the world, um, they estimate that office vacancies uh, will uh, not return uh, to the pre-COVID levels until 2025. That is uh, five years of recovery, right? Uh, but, of course, they're claiming recovery, right? Uh, if we look at uh, other sort of paper, this one from Real Capital Analytics uh, that came out in 2020 in relation to Asia-Pacific's commercial property sector, um, the transactions had dropped uh, close to 40%, and these are real estate transactions coming from a 9% uh, rental decline uh, that was caused by an oversupply of uh, property um, uh, the Middle East hottest real estate markets, such as Dubai and Abu Dhabi, uh, have also been on a downward spiral. Um, other metrics mention that the combined office vacancy uh, in Canada, Western Europe, and in the U.S. Uh, is now at around uh, 250 million square feet. That's roughly 20 million square meters of empty vacant spaces. And which is uh, double uh, of its peak uh, during the 2008 financial crisis. In Paris, the report from a real estate giant Cushman and Wakefield showed that there was a 45% drop in office take up uh, for the whole region of Paris and that the commercial property market had dropped uh, 32% just in 2020. 
um, in London, um, just uh, seven, min- seven months after the beginning of the pandemic, um, the office sector had been down to 67% uh, from its 10-year average. Um, uh, for example, shares in Unibail, which is uh, one of Europe's largest commercial real estate investment trusts, uh, which own malls, offices, hotels, and exhibition centers, um, were down more than 50% uh, compared to last year. Overall, in Western Europe, uh, many expert reports uh, claimed an average uh, decline in valuation of residential market of around 5%, um, offices close to 20%, and uh, real estate um, retail uh, around 30%. In the United States, in metropolitan regions that used to have a very strong real estate market, such as the one in Manhattan, um, it's uh, undergoing right now a record number of uh, condos for sale. Um, There was a month where their decline of rental prices went all the way to 21.7% below the average of the previous year. And uh, vacancy rates are also on a record high. Nationwide, uh, the organization of Moody's Analytics uh, uh, recently estimated that the decline of rents in 2020 uh, was 11.1% on the retail sector, and they were thinking that the office sector was going to fare much worse. Um, This was uh, double the drop of what the 2008 financial crisis had shown. So all of this quantitative data that we have been reading uh, during the year uh, it's certainly dramatic. Um, there's no arguing uh, on that. It's an unprecedented uh, sort of situation in relationship to vacancies and, uh, and emptiness in cities. However, uh, the quantitative data that begins to worry me the most are the one that starts to touch ground, uh, to touch sort of daily life of people and not so much those uh, real estate companies and investors that I had discussed uh, since the beginning of this podcast. The kind of data that I'm talking about now is um, referring to, for example, the National Restaurant Association of the United States, which has estimated that more than 100,000 eateries have uh, either closed or are uh, temporarily closed. And uh, that means that it's uh, basically one out of six eateries uh, that uh, are currently not working. And I cannot help but imagine the amount of people that depended on on those eateries that are not the kind of the Wall Street or financial investors uh, kind of people. Data such as the one that uh, demonstrate uh, the amount of money that is owned on uh, rent stabilized uh, uh, buildings or apartments in many other places of the world, it would call sort of social housing or public housing spaces. Just for example, Manhattan alone, uh, the estimate is a one billion uh, sort of debt of uh, people that are not able to pay the rent. Um, and that is certainly quite dramatic. Or the data that was gathered in a August 2020 report uh, called the COVID-19 eviction crisis, which was a consortium of researchers from organizations such as the National Low Income Housing Coalition and MIT and many others. Their estimates were that uh, 30 to 40 million people in America uh, are at risk of eviction. Um, And uh, they were warning in that report that the United States alone uh, is facing the most severe crisis uh, of housing, housing crisis in its history. This report also concluded that close to 80% of the people that are currently facing eviction are uh, minority groups, uh, but mostly people of color. So the emptiness that concerns me the most is the product of the contradictions between the crisis of the large real estate markets and the consequences of those in the main street. So the $25 billion mega real estate development uh, in New York City called Hudson Yards might have a few hundreds of condominiums uh, remain unsold it might have its small empty. Um, it might have stores that have, f- you know, filed for bankruptcy. It might have restaurants that uh, also closed. But the ones that were truly affected are those that worked in those office buildings, uh, 
those that sustain many of the shops in the mall, those that serve most of the restaurants uh, that were part of that development, which since spring have been completely empty, together with this special emptiness or vacancy comes uh, job losses, comes evictions, homelessness, crime. All of these terrible uh, consequences, uh, which are in the realm of the social, um, social dynamics, um, uh, cannot be indicated in the economic terms uh, in which uh, evictions and uh, emptiness is currently measured. Neither can these uh, quantitative metrics uh, help us predict what uh, kind of shifts in uh, social dynamics in relationships to labor, um, in relationships to how we occupy space, uh, and overall, how we are going to be using our cities. So let me try to illustrate uh, one scenario, uh, which seems to be the most common scenario uh, uh, right now, which is that the number of permanent uh, remote workers uh, will continue to increase. Um, there might be also a rise of what it's now called uh, hybrid workers, which, as many of you know, it's uh, people that go you know, half of the time to their office and the other half of the time they stay at home to work. Um, and of course, there will continue to be uh, people that will return to their jobs, um, most of them uh, in the service sector, which require a one-on-one -on -one relationship uh, with people. The case of the rising remote workers um, can be very extreme. Um, at the moment, in large cities around the world, uh, most of corporate or what people tend to call uh, white-collar workers are not going to their offices. I mean, so gigantic uh, skyscrapers uh, are empty. And in a way, uh, they continue to do their job. And so, obviously, a lot of large corporations are thinking, well, I mean, do we actually need to rent uh, or to own uh, that much space? Uh, aren't we just uh, wasting money, you know, providing uh, so much office space if we are able to be as productive or in some cases even more productive if most of our employees stay home? So many large corporations uh, have been already offering options, right, whether um, if you would want to stay home, you can stay home and, and they will allow it to. Uh, other companies are beginning to op offer the options of uh, working some kind of hybrid scenario where there might be some workers that would desire to be in an office setting, uh, but nevertheless, um, you know, you could still work from home. And obviously, for some workers, that has been very convenient to stay at home. But there's another sort of key issue that needs to be discussed and that uh, what it means, uh, uh, economically speaking, from the side of the corporation uh, to employ you uh, as you work at home. Think about the expenses of uh, renting an office. I mean, we're not only talking about space, but we're also talking about energy and all kinds of uh, infrastructure and services, uh, internet, uh, etc., that are necessary. Um, in order for an office to function. Um, when you work at home, in essence, what you're doing is that you uh, have started to subsidize uh, all of these expenses uh, from a corporation that you work with. Um, in my case, I am working at home uh, during the pandemic, and I pay my internet, uh, I pay my electricity, I uh, pay my water, all kinds of services. But I also am using a part of my space, which uh, used to be a space for leisure. It used to be a space for gathering, uh, for loving. Um, and now uh, a large part of that space, at least during certain times of the day, has become um, somehow transferred, has been transferred to the use of the corporation because ultimately the time that you spend in that space is producing money uh, and that money is being taken um, to by these corporations that employ uh, all these white-collar workers. In short, I mean, during this pandemic, um, I'm actually uh, transferring um, uh, economic output uh, to, to my employer as I use my home to work.
in the most positive scenario, um, one would think that a corporation or an employer would be paying you some kind of stipend that would cover a percentage of the use of, their, of your space uh, in order to be productive. Um, that has not been the case in the majority of uh, remote uh, working conditions uh, uh, during 2020. That is not to say that it wouldn't change uh, in 2021 or 2022, but that does not seem to be the trend. Uh, the trend is, yes, to, often, to offer um, the flexibility of you staying at home, to offer perhaps a printer, paper, or some kind of utilities and materials that you need uh, to perform, uh, but certainly not uh, to the extent that they would be calculating the actual subsidy that one is giving to the corporation for our work at home. Uh, adding to these, I mean, how can we put any form of monetary value um, for using my space uh, in relation to the, to the social, to the social dynamic? What happens when certain spaces of what uh, used to be, again, the leisure spaces of my home um, suddenly become um, uh, full of uh, work uh, um, uh, content and, and, and work files and all this sort of it? Adding to these, uh, the co-living dynamics, I mean, whether you live in a family uh, or whether you live with roommates, um, also have uh, dramatically been impacted by work at home. Um, I have heard of many complaints of friends, uh, even myself, when you know one has different kinds of meetings and you need a silent room because it's very important. And suddenly, you know, your your the space that used to be your private life, um, it gets kind of surrendered uh, for a company for a corporation. So if you're a CEO of a company and you think about sort of the impact of this uh, to your office and you remain as productive or more productive than you were before, obviously it would make a lot of sense to promote uh, any form of policy um, to keep workers at home. You will be paying less utilities, less rent, uh, perhaps even less uh, people or less employees like receptionists and so forth. Um, and at the same time, uh, you don't need to deal with uh, many of the dramatic uh, social uh, interactions that sometimes happen inside office spaces. Now, let's say that this trend uh, continues and for some reason people are willing to accept uh, this scenario and uh, work at home. Um, what happens to all that space that used to be occupied? And this is one of the biggest questions um, that uh, a lot of people are asking at the moment. Um, if telework is expanding, if hybrid work is expanding, um, what about all of that uh, empty space? What do you do with it? How do you put um, you know, social value in it? Uh, and from the side of a corporation, how do you put economic value um, in it? Now, let me go back for a bit uh, to some previous part of this podcast and when I started to mention the, the construction boom of office spaces around the world and how there was uh, a surplus uh, of office spaces. So before entering the pandemic, uh, the, the globe or all cities, uh, metropolitan regions, had already a, a vacant space available that was not going to be used and was not uh, the intention of it to be used. With the pandemic, what uh, started to happen is a lot of the space that was actually used is also or is predicted to not be used in the near uh, future. Here we're talking about uh, enormous uh, uh, sites of uh, dormant activity, um, especially areas that developed as uh, central business districts. I mean, you know, the ones that you know, get, uh, get to accumulate a lot of skyscrapers. Um, which would suddenly be deserted. Uh, all the activity that were in them um, uh, were, it's not going to be taking place anymore. And you have too many examples of places like that. I mean, from Mexico City to Buenos Aires uh, to uh, Frankfurt or Hamburg um, or different places in the UK, um, Singapore, etc. Um, you are looking at uh, large footprints of unoccupied uh, emptiness, completely devoid of uh, social interactions. <laughs>
would this mean that all of these spaces would suddenly be available at uh, lower prices uh, to be taken by a lot of the people that got impacted uh, severely from the pandemic, such as uh, those that had small commercial rents, uh, small restaurants, uh, cafes, uh, or just the small shops? Uh, would this mean also that a lot of that empty space will finally be utilized uh, to house a lot of people that need to be housed that are currently homeless or in uh, derelict, living in derelict conditions? Or would these empty spaces continue to produce money for those that own them, uh, continue to be backed by uh, central banks and bonds um, on their sort of property debt? Uh, would they uh, continue to be evaluated as financial assets even though they're empty? And uh, let me remind you that that has been the case for a lot of the emptiness that existed pre-COVID, as I discussed previously in the podcast. So the big question here is not whether we can actually have enough urban activity to utilize all of this space. I think we have uh, the need for such activities. We We need proper housing, we need uh, proper services, uh, cultural institutions, uh, schools, uh, hospitals, etc. Um, and there's uh, an incredible demand from a lot of people of space. So it is not a matter that we don't have uh, the, the activity that is necessary to fill it. Um, the question goes back again to the economic viability of offering these spaces to those that simply cannot afford what they used to uh, cost before. Is the financial sector willing to lower the prices uh, of all of this property um, and offer it to uh, general population? Or even better, uh, are we as people uh, willing to fight for stronger policy uh, to uh, take back all that emptiness, for strong fiscal reforms that push corporations to give away uh, all of these spaces for public use, for the benefit of society at large. Are our governors, uh, mayors and senators and city council members willing to fight for this? If yes, we might actually be seeing the reemergence of a new kind of fantastic urban future where spaces uh, return to public use, where walls and uh, closed buildings and securitized uh, you know, areas of the city are no longer that, but uh, are there in order to serve the needs of its population. More open and public spaces, but not only space as such, but also space as a platform for a new kind of economic activities. Activities that deal more with uh, cooperative structures, with uh, social dynamics, with uh, support systems, with solidarity economies where the informality suddenly becomes the basis of daily life as it uses the spaces that used to be occupied by all of those corporations and all of those office buildings. Where the many corporate terraces and uh, sort of pseudo-public spaces and small parks and corners um, that used to service uh, the corporate industry uh, suddenly become areas where there's uh, farming and all kinds of other productive activity where the streets are completely taken by another kind of life. So I have no doubt that uh, we are undergoing a very serious threshold where there are two ways uh, that uh, will dominate uh, our futures, uh, our urban futures. And this has to be taken very seriously. One direction is the continuation of uh, everything as, as we know it, uh, where there's a dominance of uh, finance markets and all kinds of you know, capital accumulation processes and where society remains dormant uh, to all of those dynamics. We all can easily imagine what kind of city uh, that would be in the near future. And honestly, I would not like to live in one of those. 
the other way out of this threshold is that we force ourselves to imagine other kinds of futures. Because if it's not now, then when? Uh, we always need dramatic changes and events uh, to make us realize that uh, we can do things better, that we can um, live better, that uh, our conditions can be more sustainable, uh, more agreeable, uh, more just, uh, more environmentally uh, responsible. And this is a task that uh, we all need to take seriously. We need to take a strong action and push forward for things that we thought that were not possible, but do, due to the sort of emptiness and the conditions of unemployment and all of that might be more possible now than ever. It is in moments like these that we have historically as a species have been able to advance um, our fears and uh, again better ourselves and by bettering ourselves I mean uh, bettering our spatial conditions and our environmental conditions and obviously our social conditions of justice and fairness for helping us to imagine what kind of futures those would be uh, I have invited to have a dialogue with us um, David Harvey, uh, which is a well-renowned uh, Marxist geographer, but in many occasions has written about what kind of future should we expect, should we fight for, most notably in his book, uh, Spaces of Hope, which I think he published in either 2001 or 2003, I mean, he will correct me now, um, where he has complete chapters dedicated to the need of uh, utopian thinking. And this is what I'm asking you as an audience uh, to start doing. We need to bring back the utopian thinking. We need to bring back that imagination uh, that gives us strength uh, to pursue those things that we thought were impossible. And most importantly, to claim back all that space that has been taken away from us, uh, from the finance industries and all the rest of it. So I want to welcome uh, David Harvey, with whom for the next uh, 30 minutes or so, I'm going to be having a, an interesting conversation about how he sees the future. Uh, thank you very much for listening so far. And let's continue with the conversation. In the next episode, where I will discuss with the Marxist geographer David Harvey about the impact of urban vacancies and how this can be the turning point towards the production of a more socially just urban environment. This was another episode of Cities After. Thank you for listening and don't forget to subscribe.